The fight against U.S.-sponsored terror is something that both China and Russia have in common. I mean, we're the guys who claim that we fight a global war against terrorism. We have become the terrorists. I hope people understand that. We have become the terrorists. We are responsible for setting in motion events that culminated in this horrific attack in Moscow. We are. Now the question then becomes, who would kill innocent women and children, some of them as old as 70 years old, for 5,400 US dollars? Not you, not me. Hi friends, hello and welcome to another video. Today I want to talk about the Crocus City Hall attack and uh, force Uyghur labor sanctions. The idea of this video is not to talk about the terror attacks of March 2022 that took the lives of 139 people so far, as we know, uh, in Moscow. But what I do hope to do is to link some of the confessions that were made by the apprehended suspects and some of the reports of links to extremist organizations to what the U.S. government and officials are hoping to accomplish in Xinjiang by pushing the false Uyghur genocide accusations and forced Uyghur labor sanctions. So let us address the title of this video and explore the consequences of U.S. action in Xinjiang and what they attempt to do and at the end, we're going to circle back to these alleged shooters in Russia. First, let's start with the facts about Russia. In less than 14 hours after the first shots were heard inside the concert hall, Russian authorities had already captured 11 people involved in the terrorist attack. The videos were out there, shared on social media. It was easy to identify the people. The four suspects who appeared in court yesterday are from Tajikistan and three of them have already pleaded guilty but things are developing quite fast so this may be old news already. These people face life in prison. Putin said that the attack was carried out by radical Islamists and he also questions, logically, why they were attempting to escape to Ukraine. Video evidence has come out supporting the affiliation to ISK, according to the BBC. So you've got to take that information as you wish. You know how the BBC like to inflate information. Now, video footage and still images on Russian social media appear to show the interrogation of several of the men alleged to have taken part in this attack. Of importance to this video today is the amount of money that the accused confesses to have been offered to perpetrate the attack merely 5,400 US dollars. Now here's my first observation. Even if one argues that the obvious duress during the confession is important, the amount does not affect how its perpetrators um, are perceived at that moment. The amount offers no benefit to the story, so we just take it at face value. According to the United Nations, these are the five primary drivers that are conducive to violent extremism. Number one, there's lack of socioeconomic opportunities, and that's what we're going to drop quite a bit. So, for the subject of this video, we're going to focus on the first one, which is first for a reason, probably the most important one. Lack of socioeconomic opportunities. When the U.S. and sponsored NGOs uh, throw accusations of forced labor in Xinjiang without a shred of hard evidence, merely by using public data, that is twisted and misinterpreted by people like Adrian Sands, and then American media pushes it as narrative 24-7 to American audiences, that's what builds the support for sanctions on products and sanctions on companies that are operating in Xinjiang. That is why we have things like the Uyghur Policy Act and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, as well as, well, the most recent push to increase the travel advisory for Americans to level four when they come to China, thus discouraging tourists to visit and spend money in Xinjiang, thus affecting tourism as well. Together, all these measures have affected, uh, effectively banned uh, cotton, cotton products, tomatoes, electronics, manufacturing materials, textiles, and pharmaceuticals from reaching U.S. customers. The latest item that has been targeted is cars. Brands like GM, Tesla, Toyota, BYD, Volkswagen, they all make cars in China. In February this year, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, detained thousands of luxury vehicles from German brands like Porsche, Bentley, and Audi at U.S. ports. No evidence of this, only a report by NED paid forces. 
The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act of 2022 presumes that all goods produced in whole or in part in Xinjiang or by an entity on the entity list are made with forced labor and are thus prohibited from entering the United States. This presumption, which is contrary to any legal principle that is normal, such as the presumption of innocence, presumes guilt without evidence. That is America's rules-based order for you. In February of this year, the German company BASF announced it would accelerate its exit from two joint ventures in China's Xinjiang region due to allegations of Uyghur repression against its local partner. Volkswagen, which has stood with Xinjiang even after fierce accusation and even after providing audit after audit, is now being pressured by investors to move out of Xinjiang due to these new unfounded allegations concerning aluminium sourcing. It is easy to see why many of these companies may in the end choose to move out of Xinjiang even if their many, many audits throughout the years show no signs of forced labor. They simply cannot control what the U.S. deceitfully decides to ban and what makes things worse, the U.S. has the power, the influence to force other countries to follow suit. Corporations and automator, automakers in this case simply want to make money in China. They're not willing to die on the cross for some political game that is now affecting them. What these sectors accomplish is simple. They create unemployment and deter foreign investment in the region. May I remind you how easy it is to recruit terrorists and assassins and hitmen in impoverished places like the favelas of Rio or the slums of Delhi or the communas of Medellin? It's one of the easiest things to do because of poverty. Now, when you combine poverty with indoctrination and, well, now you've got a recipe for a U.S. manufacturer terrorist hotspot in Xinjiang. The U.S. is trying once again to, to quarter China but creating conflicts in the north with Japan and South Korea, Taiwan and Philippines in the south, and Xinjiang and Tibet to the west. May I remind you that this is how China lost control of Taiwan after World War II, when Chinese troops were busy fighting the Korean War, a proxy war against China that was actually, without a doubt, instigated by the U.S. And also remember how the CIA kept making trouble in Xinjiang later on that decade, even after the Dalai Lama had signed the 14 article agreement with Beijing and was actually elected to be the vice chair of the National People's Congress from 1954 until 1959. You all can Google about the CIA payments that were made to the Dalai Lama by yourselves. So to circle back, to the Russian concert hall terrorist attack. These perpetrators claim to have been paid $5,400 to kill innocent people. Who would kill innocent people in cold blood for money? You may say, well, an extremist, or maybe a destitute person, maybe a person coerced to do it. My arguments against the extremist theory is this. A radicalized, uh, an extremist believer would much likely do it for the promise of an afterlife. An extremist would not request or require money to do something like that. An ideological terrorist is not a mercenary. Now, does that mean that the perpetrators are not extremists? No, not entirely, but let's continue because what about the option of being a mercenary? A mercenary is nothing but a private soldier who joins an armed conflict for a personal profit. A mercenary would like to have an exit strategy so as to be able to benefit from that profit. Now, in this case, all these people had in Russia was a white Renault that took them some of these accused perpetrators about 300 kilometers from Moscow before getting caught. But use your nugging for a second. 5,000 US dollars is not enough to try and go against one of the largest security apparatuses in the world, the Russian Federal Security Service of FSB or to merciless kill innocent people, which is why we simply cannot discard extortion. Having your family being controlled or threatened by a terrorist group while they force you to execute an attack like the one last Friday seems plausible. There is no single answer that satisfies one's queries. 
Perhaps the answer is a combination of all these factors, a combination of, of a certain level of radicalization, uh, some financial incentives, and most likely a certain degree of extortion. Now, my deep concern is that the U.S. is hell-bent on recreating conditions like we saw back in Xinjiang, starting with creating poverty in the region. Remember that in 2020, Mike Pompeo, the then Secretary of State, decided to delist ETIM as a terrorist organization. Mind you, the United Nations has not delisted them. They're just doing this on their own, Americans. Do remember that the U.S. forces in Afghanistan were still fighting ETIM until 2018 in Afghanistan. One brief note on ETIM, which I just mentioned. They are a terrorist organization that operates in China and the border regions of Afghanistan. But the thing is that a delisted terrorist group is much easier to back financially than a listed one. So now we have an extremist terrorist organization on the loose in the region, at least free from U.S. prosecution. What else is needed? Well, misrepresenting the Chinese anti-terror campaign in Xinjiang as a Uyghur genocide. The evidence is there if one wants to see. Xinjiang experienced horrible terrorist attacks that are similar to what we saw last Friday in Moscow. The fight against U.S.-sponsored terror is something that both China and Russia have in common. And that is not me saying it. Please listen here to Scott Ritter. I mean, we're the guys who claim that we fight a global war against terrorism. We have become the terrorists. I hope people understand that. We have become the terrorists. We are responsible for setting in motion events that culminated in this horrific attack in Moscow. We are. So there you have it, friends. That's what I wanted to share with you today. It's uh, a sad state of affairs and we need to keep fighting these liars and these terrorist organizations that are operating in and on behalf of the United States government. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. You know what to do. Like, comment, and share. And if you like the content on my channel, consider subscribing. If you want to support the work that I do, make sure to hit the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.